Welcome to a fireside reading of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 76. The Battering Ram. Ere quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you as a sensible physiologist simply particularly remark its front aspect in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling but not the less true events, perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of the head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose and that what nose he has, his spout hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead, blind wall without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme lower, backward-sloping part of the front of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone, and not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development so that this whole enormous boneless mass is as one wad. Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil. Yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head, but with this difference. About the head this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon the sharpest lance, darted by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horses' hooves. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indiamen chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks. What do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them at the point of coming contact any merely hard substance, like iron or wood, no. They hold there a large round wad of tow and cork, enveloped in the thickest and toughest of oxhide, that bravely and uninjured, takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken handspikes and iron crowbars. By itself, this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at, 
but supplementary to this, it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction, and as the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface and anon swims with it, high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of his head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, uninjurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims behind it all a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect, so that when I shall hereafter detail to you all the specialities and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity and be ready to abide by this, that though the sperm whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific, you would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow. For unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth. But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials then! What befell the weakling youth lifting the dread goddess's veil at lace? Chapter 77 The Great Heidelberg Tun I actually had to look this up. A Heidelberg Tun, it's a huge... Uh, barrel that they made jokingly to put uh, wine in it in Heidelberg, Heidelberg it's in Germany it's uh, 21 feet high by 24 feet long so it's enormous and it's a barrel that they made out of I think they said I don't know 120 oak trees or something um, and contains 40,000 gallons of wine so it's an enormously big uh, barrel. Now comes the bailing of the case. But to comprehend it aright, you must know something of the curious internal structure of the thing operated upon. Regarding the sperm whale's head as a solid oblong, you may, on an inclined plane, sideways divided into two coins. Footnote. Coin is not a Euclidean term. It belongs to the pure nautical mathematics. I know not that it has been defined before. A coin is a solid which differs from a wedge in having its sharp end formed by the steep inclination of one side instead of the mutual tapering of both sides whereof the lower is the bony structure forming the cranium and jaws and the upper an unctuous mass wholly free from bones, its broad forward end forming the expanded vertical apparent forehead of the whale. 
at the middle of the forehead horizontally, subdivide this upper coin, and then you have two almost equal parts, which before were naturally divided by an internal wall of a thick, tendinous substance. The lower subdivided part, called the junk, is one immense honeycomb of oil, formed by the crossing and recrossing into 10,000 infiltrated cells of tough, elastic white fibers throughout its whole extent. The upper part, known as the case, may be regarded as the great Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale. And as that famous great tears is mystically carved in front, so the whale's vast plaited forehead forms innumerable strange devices for the emblematical adornment of his wondrous ton. Moreover, as that of Heidelberg was always replenished with the most excellent of the wines of the Rhenish valleys, so the ton of the whale contains by far the most precious of all his oily vintages, namely the highly prized spermaceti in its absolutely pure, limpid, and odiferous state. Nor is this precious substance found unalloyed in any other part of the creature, though in life it remains perfectly fluid, yet upon exposure to the air after death, it soon begins to concrete, sending forth beautiful crystalline shoots, as when the first thin, delicate ice is just forming in water. A large whale's case generally yields about 500 gallons of sperm, though from unavoidable circumstances considerable of it is spilled, leaks, and dribbles away, or is otherwise irrevocably lost in the ticklish business of securing what you can. I know not with what fine and costly material the Heidelberg ton was coated within, but in superlative richness that coating could not possibly have compared with the silken, pearl-colored membrane, like the lining of a fine pelisse forming the inner surface of the sperm whale's case. It will have been seen that the Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale embraces the entire length of the entire top of the head, and since, as has been elsewhere set forth, the head embraces one-third of the whole length of the creature, then setting that length down at 80 feet for a good-sized whale, you have more than 26 feet for the depth of the ton when it is lengthwise hoisted up and down against a ship's side. As in decapitating the whale, the operator's instrument is brought close to the spot where an entrance is subsequently forced into the spermaceti magazine. He has therefore to be uncommonly heedful lest a careless, untimely stroke should invade the sanctuary and wastingly let out its invaluable contents. It is this decapitated end of the head also, which is at last elevated out of the water and retained in that position by the enormous cutting tackles, whose hempen combinations on one side make quite a wilderness of ropes in that quarter. Thus much being said, attend now, I pray you, to that marvelous and, in this particular instance, almost fatal operation whereby the sperm whale's great Heidelberg ton is tapped. Chapter 78 Cistern and Buckets Nimble as a cat, Tashtigo mounts a lot and without altering his erect posture, runs straight out upon the overhanging mainyard arm to the part where it exactly projects over the hoisted ton. He has carried with him a light tackle called a whip, consisting of only two parts traveling through a single sheaved block. Securing this block so that it hangs down from the yard arm, 
He swings one end of the rope till it is caught and firmly held by a hand on deck. Then, hand over hand, down the other part, the Indian drops through the air till dexterously he lands on the summit of the head. There, still high, elevated above the rest of the company, to whom he vivaciously cries, he seems some Turkish muezzin calling the good people to prayers from the top of a tower. A short-handled sharp spade being sent up to him, he diligently searches for the proper place to begin breaking into the tun. In this business he proceeds very heedfully, like a treasure hunter in some old house, sounding the walls to find where the gold is masoned in. By the time this cautious search is over, a stout iron-bound bucket, precisely like a well bucket, has been attached to one end of the whip, while the other end, being stretched across the deck, is there held by two or three alert hands. These last now hoist the bucket within grasp of the Indian, to whom another person has reached up a very long pole. Inserting this pole into the bucket, Tashtigo downward guides the bucket into the tun till it entirely disappears. Then, giving the word to the seaman at the whip, up comes the bucket again, all bubbling like a dairymaid's pail of new milk. Carefully lowered from its height, the full freighted vessel is caught by an appointed hand and quickly emptied into a large tub. Then, remounting aloft, it again goes through the same round until the deep cistern will yield no more. Towards the end, Tashtigo has to ram his long pole harder and harder and deeper and deeper into the tun until some twenty feet of the pole have gone down. Now, the people of the Pequod had been bailing some time in this way. Several tubs had been filled with the fragrant sperm when, all at once, a queer accident happened. Whether it was that Tashtigo, that wild Indian, was so heedless and reckless as to let go for a moment his one-handed hold on the great cabled tackles suspending the head, or whether the place where he stood was so treacherous and oozy, or whether the evil one himself would have it to fall out so without stating his particular reasons. How it was exactly, there is no telling now, but on a sudden, as the 80th or 90th bucket came sucklingly up, my God, poor Tashtigo! like the twin reciprocating bucket in a veritable well, dropped head foremost down into this great tun of Heidelberg, and with a horrible oily gurgling, went clean out of sight. Man overboard, cried Dagu, who amid the general consternation first came to his senses. Swing the bucket this way! and putting one foot into it so as to the better secure his slippery handhold on the whip itself, the hoisters ran him high up to the top of the head almost before Tashtigo could have reached its interior bottom. Meantime, there was a terrible tumult. Looking over the side, they saw of the before lifeless head throbbing and heaving just below the surface of the sea, as if that moment seized with some momentous idea, whereas it was only the poor Indian unconsciously revealing by those struggles the perilous depth to which he had sunk. At this instant, while Dagu on the summit of the head was clearing the whip, which had somehow got foul of the great cutting tackles, a sharp cracking noise was heard, and to the unspeakable horror of all, one of the two enormous hooks suspending the head, tore out, and with a vast vibration the enormous mass sideways swung till the drunk ship reeled and shook as if smitten by an iceberg. 
The one remaining hook upon which the entire strain now depended seemed every instant to be on the point of giving way, an event still more likely from the violent motions of the head. Come down, come down, yelled the seaman to Dagoo, but with one hand holding on to the heavy tackles so that if the head should drop, he would still remain suspended, the negro having cleared the foul line, rammed down the bucket into the now collapsed well, meaning that the buried harpooner should grasp it and so be hoisted out. In heaven's name, man, cried Stubb, are you ramming home a cartridge there? A vast! How will that help him, jamming that iron-bound bucket on top of his head? Avast, will ye? Stand clear of the tackle, cried a voice like the bursting of a rocket. Almost in the same instant, with a thunder boom, the enormous mass dropped into the sea like Niagara's table rock into the whirlpool. The suddenly relieved hull rolled away from it to far down her glittering copper, and all caught their breath as, half swinging now over the sailors' heads and now over the water, Dagoo, through a thick mist of spray, was dimly beheld clinging to the pendulous tackles, while poor, buried alive Tashtigo was sinking utterly down to the bottom of the sea. But hardly had the blinding vapour cleared away when a naked figure with a boarding sword in his hand was for one swift moment seen hovering over the bulwarks. The next, a loud splash announced that my brave Quig-Quig had dived to the rescue. One packed rush was made to the side, and every eye counted every ripple as moment followed moment, and no sign of either the sinker or the diver could be seen. Some hands now jumped into a boat alongside and pushed a little off from the ship. Ha! Ha! cried Dagoo all at once from his now quiet swinging perch overhead. And looking further off from the sea, we saw an arm thrust upright from the blue waves, a sight strange to see as an arm thrust forth from the grass over a grave. Both! Both! It is both! cried Dagoo again with a joyful shout. And soon after, Queequeg was seen boldly striking out with one hand and with the other clutching the long hair of the Indian. Drawn into the waiting boat, they were quickly brought to the deck. But Tashtigo was long in coming too, and Quiquig did not look very brisk. Now, how had this noble rescue been accomplished? Why, diving after the slowly descending head, Quiquig, with his keen sword, had made side lunges near its bottom so as to scuttle a large hole there, then, dropping his sword, had thrust his long arm upwards and inwards, and so hauled out poor Tash by the head. He averred that upon first thrusting in for him, a leg was presented, but well knowing that that was not as it ought to be and might occasion great trouble, he had thrust back the leg, and by a dexterous heave and toss, had wrought a somerset upon the Indian, so that with the next trial he came forth in the good old way, head foremost. As for the great head itself, that was doing as well as could be expected. And thus, through the courage and great skill in obstetrics, of quick, quick, the deliverance, or rather delivery, of Tashtigo was successfully accomplished in the teeth, too, of the most untoward and apparently hopeless impediments, which is a lesson by no means to be forgotten. Midwifery should be taught in the same course with fencing and boxing, riding and rowing. 
I know that this queer adventure of the gay headers will be sure to seem incredible to some landsmen, though they themselves may have either seen or heard of someone's falling into a cistern ashore, an accident which not seldom happens, and with much less reason too than the Indians, considering the exceeding slipperiness of the curb of the sperm whale's well. But for adventure it may be sagaciously urged, how is this? We thought the tissued, infiltrated head of the sperm whale was the lightest and most corky part about him, and yet thou makest it sink in an element of a far greater specific gravity than itself. We have thee there. Not at all, but I have ye. For at the time poor Tash fell in, the case had been nearly emptied of its lighter contents, leaving little but the dense, tenderness wall of the well, a double-welded, hammered substance, as I have before said, much heavier than the sea water, and a lump of which sinks in it like lead, almost. But the tendency to rapid sinking in this substance was in the present instance materially counteracted by the other parts of the head remaining undetached from it, so that it sank very slowly and deliberately indeed, affording Queequeg a fair chance for performing his agile obstetrics on the run, as you might say. Yes, it was a running delivery, so it was. Now, had Tashtigo perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing, smothered in the very whitest and daintiest of fragrant spermaceti, coffined, hearsed, and tombed in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale. Only one sweeter end can readily be recalled, the delicious death of an Ohio honey hunter, who, seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such exceeding store of it that, leaning too far over, it sucked him in so that he died embalmed. How many, think ye, have likewise fallen into Plato's honey head and sweetly perished there? Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you same time and place tomorrow, 5 Pacific, at Fireside Reading on Instagram. And please do uh, check out the YouTube channel, Fireside Reading, and like and subscribe and comment if you'd like. I certainly do like receiving them. Until I see you again, please be very well. Goodbye. <laughs>